Part One of the Aliens by Murray Leinster. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tabithat. The Aliens by Murray Leinster. Part One. At zero four hours ten minutes ship time, the Nicola was well inside the Theta Gisol solar system. She had previously secured excellent evidence that this was not the home of the plumy civilization. There was no tuned radiation. There was no evidence of interplanetary travel. Rockets would be more than obvious, and a magnetronic drive had a highly characteristic radiation pattern. So the real purpose of the Nicola's voyage would not be accomplished here. She wouldn't find out where plumies came from. There might, though, be one of those singular, conical, hollow-topped cairns sheltering silicon-bronze plates which constituted the evidence that plumies existed. The Nicola went sunward toward the inner planets to see. Such cairns had been found on conspicuous landmarks on oxygen-type planets over a range of some twelve hundred light-years. By the vegetation about them, some were a century old. On the same evidence, others had been erected only months or weeks or even days before a human space survey ship arrived to discover them. And the situation was unpromising. It wasn't likely that the galaxy was big enough to hold two races of rational beings capable of space travel. Back on ancient Earth, the planet had been too small to hold two races with tools and fire. Historically, that problem was settled when Homo sapiens exterminated Homo neanderthalus. It appeared that the same situation had arisen in space. There were humans, and there were plumies. Both had interstellar ships. To humans the fact was alarming. The need for knowledge, and the danger that plumies might know more first, and thereby be able to exterminate humanity, was appalling. Therefore the Nicola. She drove on sunward. She had left one frozen outer planet far behind. She had crossed the orbits of three others. The last of these was a gas-giant with innumerable moonlets revolving about it. It was now some thirty millions of miles back, and twenty to one side. The sun, ahead, flared and flamed in emptiness against that expanse of tinted stars. John Baird worked steadily in the Nicola's radar room. He was one of those who hoped that the plumies would not prove to be the natural enemies of mankind. Now it looked like this ship wouldn't find out in this solar system. There were plenty of other ships on the hunt. From here on it looked like routine to the next unvisited family of planets. But meanwhile he worked. Opposite him Diane Holt worked as steadily, her dark head bent intently over a radiograph in formation. The immediate job was the completion of a map of the meteor swarms following cometary orbits about this sun. They interlaced emptiness with hazards to navigation, and nobody would try to drive through a solar system without such a map. Elsewhere in the ship everything was normal. The engine-room was a place of stillness and peace, save for the almost inaudible hum of the drive, running at half a million gas-flux density. The skipper did whatever skippers do when they are invisible to their subordinates. The weapons officer, Taine, thought appropriate thoughts. In the navigation-room the second officer conscientiously glanced at each separate instrument at least once in each five minutes, and then carefully surveyed all the screens showing space outside the ship. The stewards disposed of the debris of the last meal, and began to get ready for the next. In the crew's quarters, those off duty read or worked at Scrimshaw, or simply and contentedly loafed. Diane handed over the transparent radiograph to be fitted into the three-dimensional map in the making. "'There's a lump of stuff here,' she said interestedly. "'It could be the comet that once followed this orbit, now so old it's lost all its gases and isn't a comet any longer.' At this instant, which was zero four hours, twenty-five minutes ship time, the alarm-bell rang. It clanged stridently over Baird's head, repeater-gongs sounded all through the ship, and there was a scurrying and a closing of doors. The alarm-gong could mean only one thing. It made one's breath come faster, or one's hair stand on end, according to temperament. The skipper's face appeared on the direct-line screen from the navigation-room. "'Plumies,' he demanded harshly. "'Mr. Baird, plumies?' Baird's hands were already flipping switches and plugging the radar room apparatus into a new setup. "'There's a contact, sir,' he said curtly. "'No, there was a contact. It's broken now. Something detected us. We picked up a radar pulse. One.' The word one meant much. A radar system that could get adequate information from a single pulse was not the work of amateurs. It was the product of a very highly developed technology. 
setting all equipment to full globular scanning, Baird felt a certain crawling sensation at the back of his neck. He'd been mapping within a narrow range above and below the line of this system's ecliptic. A lot could have happened outside the area he'd had under long-distance scanning. But seconds passed. They seemed like years. The all-globe scanning covered every direction out from the Nikola. Nothing appeared which had not been reported before. The gas-giant planet far behind, and the only inner one on this side of the sun, would return their pulses only after minutes. Meanwhile the radars reported very faithfully, but they only repeated previous reports. "'No new object within half a million miles,' said Baird, after a suitable interval. Presently he added, "'Nothing new within three-quarter million miles.' Then, "'Nothing new within a million miles.' The skipper said bitingly, "'Then you'd better check on objects that are not new.' He turned aside, and his voice came more faintly as he spoke into another microphone. "'Mr. Tane, arm all rockets and have your tube crew stand by in combat readiness. Engine room, prepare drive for emergency manoeuvres. Damage control parties, put on pressure suits and take combat posts with equipment.' His voice rose again in volume. "'Mr. Baird, how about observed objects?' Diane murmured. Baird said briefly, "'Only one suspicious object, sir, and that shouldn't be suspicious. We are sending an information beam at something we'd classed as a burnt-out comet. Pulse going out now, sir.' Diane had the distant information transmitter aimed at what she'd said might be a dead comet. Baird pressed the button. An extraordinary complex of information-seeking frequencies and forms sprang into being and leapt across emptiness. There were microwaves of strictly standard amplitude for measurement standards. There were frequencies of other values which would be selectively absorbed by this material and that. There were laterally and circularly polarized beams. When they bounced back, they would bring a surprising amount of information. They returned. They did bring back news. The thing that had registered as a larger lump in a meteor swarm was not a meteor at all. It returned four different frequencies with a relative intensity pattern which said that they'd been reflected by bronze, probably silicon bronze. The polarized beams came back depolarized, of course, but with phase changes which said the reflector had a rounded regular form. There was a smooth hull of silicon bronze out yonder. There was other data. "'It will be a plumy ship, sir,' said Baird, very steadily. At a guess, they picked up our mapping beam and shot a single pulse at us to find out who and what we were. For another guess, by now they've picked up and analysed our information beam and know what we've found out about them. The skipper scowled. How many of them, he demanded. Have we run into a fleet? I'll check, sir, said Baird. We picked up no tuned radiation from outer space, sir, but it could be that they picked us up when we came out of overdrive and stopped all their transmissions until they had us in a trap. "'Find out how many there are,' barked the skipper. "'Make it quick. Report additional data instantly.' His screen clicked off. Diane, more than a little pale, worked swiftly to plug the radar room equipment into a highly specialised pattern. The Nicola was very well equipped radar-wise. She'd been a Type G-8 survey ship, and on her last stay in port she'd been rebuilt specially to hunt for and make contact with plumies. Since the discovery of their existence, that was the most urgent business of the space survey. It might well be the most important business of the human race, on which its survival or destruction would depend. Other remodelled ships had gone out before the Nicola, and others would follow until the problem was solved. Meanwhile, the Nicola's twenty-four rocket tubes and stepped-up drive and computer-type radar system equipped her for plumie hunting, as well as any human ship could be. Still, if she'd been lured deep into the home system of the Plumies, the prospects were not good. The new setup began its operation instantly the last contact closed. The three-dimensional map served as a matrix to control it. The information beam projector swung and flung out its bundle of oscillations. It swung and flashed and swung and flashed. It had to examine every relatively nearby object for a constitution of silicon bronze and a rounded shape. The nearest objects had to be examined first. Speed was essential, but three-dimensional scanning takes time, even at some hundreds of pulses per minute. Nevertheless, the information came in. No other silicon-bronze object within a quarter million miles. Within half a million. A million. A million and a half. Two million. Baird called the navigation room. "'Looks like a single plumy ship, sir,' he reported. "'At least there's one ship which is nearest by a very long way.' "'Ha!' grunted the skipper. 
"'Then we'll pay him a visit. Keep an open line, Mr. Baird.' His voice changed. "'Mr. Tain, report here at once to plan tactics.' Baird shook his head to himself. The Nicola's orders were to make contact without discovery, if such a thing were possible. The ideal would be a plumy ship, or the plumy civilization itself, located and subject to complete and overwhelming envelopment by human ships, before the plumies knew they'd been discovered. And this would be the human ideal, because humans have always had to consider that a stranger might be hostile, until he'd proven otherwise. Such a viewpoint would not be optimism, but caution. Yet caution was necessary. It was because the survey brass felt the need to prepare for every unfavourable eventuality that Taine had been chosen as weapons officer of the Nicola. His choice had been deliberate, because he was a xenophobe. He had been a problem personality all his life. He had a seemingly congenital fear and hatred of strangers, which in mild cases is common enough. But Taine could not be cured without a complete breakdown of personality. He could not serve on a ship with a multiracial crew, because he was invincibly suspicious of and hostile to all but his own small breed. Yet he seemed ideal for weapons officer on the Nicola, provided he never commanded the ship. Because if the Plumies were hostile, a well-adjusted normal man would never think as much like them as a Tain. He was capable of the kind of thinking Plumies might practice, if they were xenophobes themselves. But to Baird, so extreme a precaution as a known psychopathic condition in an officer was less than wholly justified. It was by no means certain that the Plumies would instinctively be hostile. Suspicious, yes, cautious, certainly. But the only fact known about the Plumie civilization came from the cairns and silicon-bronze inscribed tablets they'd left on oxygen-type worlds over a twelve-hundred light-year range in space and the only thing to be deduced about the plumies themselves came from the decorative, formalized symbols like feathery plumes, which were found on all their bronze tablets. The name plumies came from that symbol. Now, though, Taine was called to the navigation room to confer on tactics. The Nicola swerved and drove toward the object Baird identified as a plumie ship. This was at zero five hours ten minute ship time. The human ship had a definite velocity sunward, of course. The plumy ship had been concealed by the meteor swarm of a totally unknown comet. It was an excellent way to avoid observation. On the other hand, the Nicola had been mapping, which was bound to attract attention. Now each ship knew of the other's existence. Since the Nicola had been detected, she had to carry out orders and attempt a contact to gather information. Baird verified that the Nicola's course was exact for interception at her full-drive speed. He said in a flat voice, I wonder how the Plumies will interpret this change of course. They know we're aware they're not a meteorite, but charging at them without even trying to communicate could look ominous. We could be stupid or too arrogant to think of anything but a fight. He pressed the skipper's call and said evenly, Sir, I request permission to attempt to communicate with the Plumie ship. We're ordered to try to make friends if we know we've been spotted. Taine had evidently just reached the navigation room. His voice snapped from the speaker. I advise against that, sir. No use letting them guess our level of technology. Baird said coldly, They've got a good idea already. We've beamed them for data. There was silence, with only the faint humming sound which was natural in the ship in motion. It would be deadly to the nerves if there were absolute silence. The skipper grumbled. Requests and advice. Damn it, Mr. Baird, you might wait for orders. But I was about to ask you to try to make contact through signals. Do so. His speaker clicked off. Baird said, It's in our laps, Diane, and yet we have to follow orders. Send the first roll. Diane had a tape threaded into a transmitter. It began to unroll through a pickup head. She put on headphones. The tape began to transmit toward the plumie. Back at base, it had been reasoned that a pattern of clickings, plainly artificial and plainly stating facts known to both races, would be the most reasonable way to attempt to open contact. The tape sent a series of cardinal numbers, one to five, then an addition table from one plus one to five plus five, then a multiplication table up to five times five. It was not startlingly intellectual information to be sent out in tiny clicks ranging up and down the radio spectrum, but it was orders. Baird sat with compressed lips. Diane listened for a repetition of any of the transmitted signals sent back by the plumie. The speakers about the radar room murmured the orders given through all the ship. 
Radar had to be informed of all orders and activity, so it could check their results outside the ship. So Baird heard the orders for the engine room to be sealed up, and the duty force to get into pressure suits in case the Nicola fought and was hulled. Damage control parties reported themselves on posts, in suits, with equipment ready. Then Taine's voice snapped. "'Rocket crews, arm even-numbered rockets with chemical explosive warheads. Leave odd-numbered rockets armed with atomics. Report back.' Diane strained her ears for possible retransmission of the Nicola's signals, which would indicate the Plumie's willingness to try conversation. But she suddenly raised her hand and pointed to the radiograph instrument. It repeated the positioning of dots which were stray meteoric matter in the space between worlds in this system. What had been a spot, the Plumie ship, was now a line of dots. Baird pressed the button. "'Radar reporting,' he said curtly. "'The Plumie ship is heading for us.' I'll have relative velocity in ten seconds." He heard the skipper swear. Ten seconds later the Doppler measurement became possible. It said the plumie plunged toward the Nicola at miles per second. In half a minute it was tens of miles per second. There was no retransmission of signals. The plumie ship had found itself discovered. Apparently it considered itself attacked. It flung itself into a headlong dash for the Nicola. Time passed, interminable time. The sun flared and flamed and writhed in emptiness. The great gas-giant planet rolled through space in splendid state, its moonlet spinning gracefully about its bulk. The oxygen-atmosphere planet to sunward was visible only as a crescent, but the mottlings on its lighted part changed as it revolved, seas and islands and continents receiving the sunlight as it turned. Meteor swarms, so dense in appearance on a radar screen, yet so tenuous in reality, floated in their appointed orbits with a seeming vast leisure. The feel of slowness was actually the result of distance. Men have always acted upon things close by. Battles have always been fought within eye range, anyhow. But it was actually zero six hours thirty-five minutes ship time before the two spacecraft sighted each other, more than two hours after they plunged towards a rendezvous. The plumie ship was a bright golden dot at first. It decelerated swiftly. In minutes it was a rounded end on disk. Then it swerved lightly and presented an elliptical broadside to the Nicola. The Nicola was in full deceleration, too, by then. The two ships came very nearly to a stop with relation to each other when they were hardly twenty miles apart, which meant great daring on both sides. Baird heard the skipper grumbling. "'Damned cocky!' he roared suddenly. "'Mr. Baird, how have you made out in communicating with them?' "'Not at all, sir,' said Baird grimly. "'They don't reply.' He knew from Diane's expression that there was no sound in the headphones except the frying noise all main-sequence stars give out, and the infrequent thumping noises that come from gas-giants' planets' lower atmospheres, and the Jansky radiation hiss which comes from everywhere. The skipper swore. The plumie ship lay broadside too, less than a score of miles away. It shone in the sunlight. It acted with extraordinary confidence. It was as if it dared the Nicola to open fire. End of Part 1